Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse number 10, reading through verse number 17. Put it on the screen for us today in this place. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 17. The King James text today reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. I want to talk to us today on the topic, Properly Handling the Sword. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord once again in prayer at this hour. Master, we love you, God, and once again, we are so appreciative for the house of God. We're so appreciative for this place where we might go, whether it be physically or whether it be by reason of the Internet. We're able to come, Lord, to this place we're able to feel the Spirit of God as we sing the wonderful songs of the church, as we hear testimonies from the saints, as the Word of God goes forth, Lord, our faith is able to grow and it is able to be multiplied over and over again. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Master, in the name of Jesus right now, I loose in the name of the Lord, I loose the anointing, the power, the presence of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I need that power to stand behind me as I preach. I need that power today to reach out to those that hear. Lord, that it might touch their ear, but more importantly, that it might touch their heart that they will receive today, Lord, that which the Spirit of God would speak unto the church through His servant. Master, today, if ever, the people of God have needed a word from heaven, we need it now. And, oh, Master, more than anything, I pray that I would be your oracle, your mouthpiece, your voice at this hour to declare, thus saith the Lord, for the benefit of God's people. Grant it this hour, we pray, for I ask it in the precious holy name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, most people today understand the concept of the Word of God as a sword. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and he speaks of what is called the whole armor of God. 
in speaking of the whole armor, he goes through a whole list of items that are part and parcel to the armor. He talks about uh, how our breastplate is uh, righteousness and how we ought to be girt about with truth. And that girt about with truth would be in, in the area of armor. That would actually be what is referred to as mail. Or it is, uh, it is a fabric, as it were, that hangs from an individual that is comprised of chain. It's made up of interlocking metal, uh, you know, pieces of metal, and they call it mail. And that mail is able to stop the tip of a sword from going through and piercing the individual who wears it. So he goes on to describe the armor that a believer is to wear. And it's so funny to me because in verse 16 he said, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So what he is telling us is, of all the armor that we are to wear, he, he admonishes the believers, listen, he admonishes the believers to put on the whole armor of God. This isn't about just taking one piece or one part of it and wearing it because one part of it does you no good. If you're wearing a helmet but the rest of your body is exposed, then you're dead. If you're wearing the breastplate but your legs, your arms, your back is exposed, you're dead. Do you follow what I'm saying? For armor to be effective, you must wear it all. And at the same time, Paul says, but above all, in other words, the most important thing that you must be certain to carry is the shield of faith. Why? Because he said the shield of faith is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What do fiery darts, what does that imply? Tell you what it implies. It implies weaponry that is mobile. See, it's not hand-to-hand -hand combat. When somebody fires an arrow at you, then the weaponry is coming at you. It's not the, the guy doesn't have to hold it in his hand and do this. When you're fighting sword to sword, then it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. But you see, the shield of faith is able to protect you from weaponry that does not require hand-to-hand -hand combat. Even if the assault is coming from a distance, the shield of faith can protect you. All the other armor is designed to protect you when the assault is close, when the assault is one-on-one -on -one and hand-to-hand. -hand. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? But it's funny that Paul said, above all taking the shield of faith. So the most important thing, listen to me now, is not the sword of the Spirit. Oh my goodness. The most important part of your armor is not the sword of the Spirit. The most important part of the armor is the shield of faith. That's what Paul said. He said, above all. And then, at the end of the list, it's so funny, every time you read in Scripture where something is listed, God always lists it according to importance. It's always going to be listed according to the greatest importance to the least important. Isn't it interesting? He said, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit are the last two items that we're admonished to have. The last item on the list is the sword of the Spirit, which is, according to Paul, the Word of God. Does that mean the Word of God is not important? Absolutely not. Because if we're doing this thing right, Paul said, we're to take on the whole armor of God. Therefore, without the Word of God, we're incomplete. 
without the sword of the Spirit, we're not fully dressed for war. Am I telling the truth? No, it's an important ingredient, but it's not as important as truth. My Lord, have mercy. It's not as important as truth. It's not as important as righteousness. It's not as important. Listen to the way Paul worded it in verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. But he doesn't stop at the word gospel. He says the gospel of peace. See, there's an interesting thing about Christianity. Christians have been called to be a people of peace. We're not a people of war. When he said your feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, he is literally saying that as believers, we ought always be walking toward or striving for peace. We're not a people of war. But there is a spiritual war going on around us. The Apostle Paul said at the beginning of our text today, he said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Listen to the language. He said, We wrestle not. What does that imply? It implies hand-to-hand -hand combat. He didn't say we war not. He said we wrestle not. It's hand-to-hand combat. -hand combat. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then he said, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. He then lists the armor in order of importance. Interestingly enough, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Honey, if you don't have the truth, you are dead meat from the start. The most important possession that a believer can have is the truth. This is why you better be careful, you Trump worshiping Christians. You better be careful about the leadership you follow and the teaching and the preaching that they offer and how they lead you into falsehoods and they lead you into lies and they lead you into deception and they convince you that God's people are supposed to be a warring people. We're supposed to be out there fighting for America. We're supposed to be out there fighting for our society. We're supposed to be out there fighting for our culture. That is garbage. No, God's people are a people of peace. I Every Sunday I use this passage. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Those two things without which no man shall see the Lord. God's people are a people of peace. But if we're a people of peace, why then do we wear armor? Well, we wear armor because even though we're a people of peace, we still have an enemy. The enemy is spiritual. The enemy engages us in very close, hand-to-hand, -hand personal combat. A lot of times we're fighting the enemy laying in our bed at night and our mind is racing. A lot of times we're fighting the enemy as we're going about our business every day running errands and the enemy is coming against our mind and we've got all these thoughts coming against our faith and our confidence in God and causing us to question our relationship with God, causing us to question uh, His favor toward us, His blessing in our life causing us to question whether or not he's even interested in hearing and answering our prayer. It's a very personal combat, isn't it? It's very close. Why? Because we wrestle with it. This is something we deal with on a hand-to-hand -hand basis. This isn't the enemy shooting at us from afar. 
But even though we're a people of peace, the Word of God says, Paul writes to the people at Ephesus, the believers at Ephesus, he writes to them of putting on the whole armor of God. Why? He tells us why. It frustrates me that so many preachers and Christians will just tear this passage to shreds and they will misrepresent it. He said, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, listen, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. What does that mean? It means that you may be able to endure the attack. Mm -hmm. And having done all to leave the devil dead on the road, nope, having done all to stand. So what is the purpose of our armor? Just like any armor, listen to me children, our armor is defense, not offense. Mm -hmm. Armor has nothing in the world to do with offense. Armor has everything to do with defense. It is to protect you. It is to keep you safe. We are a people of peace, but we have an enemy. We have an enemy that likes to engage us in battle. So God has provided us armor to keep us safe when the enemy attacks so that we can survive the attack and come out on the other side still standing. Hallelujah! Oh my God! To hear so many preachers say it, the armor of God allows us to go in, bless the Lord, and tear the enemy to shreds. No, that's not our job. Have you not ever read in your Bible that the battle is not yours, but God's? It takes a real fool to think that God needs you to fight for Him. You have to be a real airhead to think that God needs a bunch of weak, measly little human beings to fight His battles for Him. No, God has not called you to fight any battle on His behalf. That's right. No, but He's equipped us to be able to survive the battle when the battle comes to us. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, my Lord, have mercy, I want to tell you. This is exciting. You see, a lot of people understand, Tommy, the concept of the Word of God as it is described in Ephesians 6, and it is called the Sword of the Spirit. A lot of people understand the concept of the Word of God as a sword. But like any dangerous implement or weapon, the Word of God, also known as the sword of the Spirit, can be carelessly or recklessly handled. And when it is recklessly, carelessly handled, it causes damage and even death oftentimes, listen, to innocent victims. As is the case with any dangerous tool or any dangerous weapon, it is imperative that we properly be properly trained in the use and in the function of such devices. We have to know how to properly and safely handle that weapon. Got news for you, children. God's people today need to be trained. They need to understand, as I've titled my message today, properly handling the sword. They need to be trained how to properly handle the Word of God, how to properly handle the sword of the Spirit, as it represents the only offensive weapon in our armor. The only item in our armor that has any offensive function 
is the Word of God. So, that means we better know how to use it. Amen. We better know how to use it properly. Paul gives us clear instruction and clear understanding in Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 11, listen, he tells us that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What is the purpose of the armor? Well, when we first understand that the sword of the Spirit is given us for the purpose of, listen, self-defense and not for the purpose of attack or offense, we immediately understand how quickly it can be misused. Nowhere are we told to wield the Word of God as an offensive weapon. Nowhere. It is given us so that we might withstand the wiles of the enemy. We are not called to go in and mow down the enemy. We are not called to use it to disable or eliminate anyone. It is not given us so that we might do anything for or to anyone else. It is given us, listen to me children, to benefit us. It is able to keep us and to preserve us when our faith is under attack. In verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Folks, our enemy is spiritual and is not natural. No man, nor any woman, no group of people, no nationality is defined by the word. tired of stupidity in the church. Paul makes it abundantly clear that the enemy we fight is a spiritual enemy. Therefore, if we are to fight a spiritual enemy, we must wear a spiritual armor. Do we engage the enemy? No, but the enemy engages us. If we are doing what God has called us to do, we are fully prepared for the attacks of the enemy because we have taken and put on the whole armor, not part of it. We're not running around naked with a sword in our hand. There's a lot of Christians, that people that call themselves Christians, and that is exactly what they're doing. They're running around nude as a jaybird with a sword in their hand, chopping and slicing everything that stands before them and they're murdering innocent people they're destroying innocent lives they're pushing people away from God and out of the church because they're careless and they're foolish in their handling of the sword of the spirit not understanding the sword of the spirit is but one element of the overall armor and the armor in its entirety, including the sword, is designed for defense. I know how to shoot a gun. I own guns. I go to the range. I fire them. I'm a pretty good shot. You will never see me running out in the street trying to mow people down. No, but now, if you come into my house uninvited, you think you're going to do my partner or I harm, then you might wind up with some lead between the eyeballs. But I will not use that weapon offensively. It is for self 
defense. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? That weapon is to benefit me. It is to keep me safe and my home safe and my partner safe. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? The same is true of the Word of God. It is there to help protect you. But it is only to be used on the enemy. The enemy is not your gay neighbor. The enemy is not the drunkard down the street. The enemy is not the prostitute who works the street corner by your house. The enemy is not the sinner. The enemy is not the unbeliever. The enemy is not a liberal. The enemy is not a democrat. The enemy is spiritual. And the enemy you need to be concerned with is going to come to you, honey. You don't have to worry about it. He'll be coming to you. Mm -hmm. When he does, if you've done what the Word of God tells you to do, you will have put on the whole armor of God and you will have the shield of faith and you will have the sword of the Spirit and you will be fully prepared to defend your Self. Defend yourself again. I'm going to keep repeating this, driving this point home. Against a spiritual enemy. Not against flesh and blood. Isn't it funny, Paul said, that our enemy is not flesh and blood. He used that specific phrase. Therefore, no human being on this planet can be defined as an enemy of God or the enemy of God's people or the enemy of God's church. There are human beings sometimes who are under the influence of the enemy, but that does not make them the enemy. Did you hear me? That does not make them the enemy. Therefore, our weapon is never to be drawn and used against another human being. I remember one time years ago, I was living in Fort Worth as a teenager. God had called me to Texas. I came to Fort Worth. I was working at a 7-Eleven. I was behind the counter, and one day this young man came in, and he was obviously gay. He was rather light on his feet and a little bit on the flamboyant side, some might say. And this man came into the store, and somehow or another, this young man and this other man kind of came into contact with one another. And all of a sudden, I heard the one man, not the young gay man, but the other fellow, screaming at the top of his lungs, Man shall not lie with a man as with a woman. And all this garbage. Or oh, he pulled out his sword. He was wielding his sword. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to let him have it with the word of God. The only problem is, stupid, he's not your enemy. He's not the one you're supposed to use that weapon on. Did he attack you? Did he attack your faith? Did he say one word to you that was designed to try to cause you to compromise your walk with God or compromise your faith? Did he say one thing or do one thing in by way of a spiritual attack on you. No. Young man didn't say nothing. This man saw how he behaved and how he acted, and he decided, boy, I'm going to let him have it with the Word of God. And I remember even then, I was in the holiness movement back then, and I looked at that man and I thought to myself, what a jackass. Even then, because I knew that that kind of handling of God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, was wrong. It was inappropriate. He was being destructive with it. He was being hurtful with it. He would drive that young man further away from God. Nothing in the way he approached things would cause that young man to know God loves him. Nothing. No. Everything he did was wrong. But there are Christians today who think that the Word of God is to be weaponized. Oh, it is. But only against the enemy. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but our enemy is spiritual. Even the greatest of sinners or the most wicked of men are not today our enemy. One may be the enemy of democracy. Listen to me, children. But they are not the enemy of the church. So if the church is going to fight somebody because they are the enemy of democracy, then you are misguided and misled and you're fighting a war that doesn't belong to you. The enemy of the church has the ability to bring destruction upon our souls. Listen to me. The enemy of the church is able to bring destruction upon our soul. Listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him, 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 which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So our enemy is one who is able to bring destruction upon our soul. Do you follow what I'm telling you? There is not a human being on this planet that has that ability. Not a single one. Why do so many Christians run about Afraid of this one or afraid of that one. Afraid of this group of people or that group of people. No human being has the power or the ability to affect our salvation in any way. In John 10, 27 through 30, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall, listen, any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What has the Lord just said? We got people running around afraid of these people, afraid of those people. Oh, I'm afraid of this one. I'm afraid. Who did the Lord say we ought to be afraid of? Who's the one the Lord said we ought to have a healthy fear of? The one who's able to destroy our soul. He then goes on to tell us elsewhere that there's not a man on this planet that has that ability. He might tell the truth. There is not a man on this planet, a woman on this planet, who can pluck you out of God's hand. So why on earth would you be afraid of of other people. Why? Do you see how we are so misguided? Do you see how preachers get up and they preach that this group is the enemy and that group is the enemy and these people are the enemy and then they have God's people running around wielding the Word of God and weaponizing it against other people. And that is wrong. That is not the proper handling of the sword of the Spirit. In verse 13 of Ephesians 6, our primary text today, the Apostle Paul said, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The sword of the Spirit was never meant to be used alone. Listen to me carefully, children. The sword of the Spirit was never meant to be used alone. It is but one part of our overall armament. We are not called to brandish the sword alone, but to put on the whole armor of God. Again, 
the end to which we arm ourselves is not to go against anyone, but rather to assure that when the enemy comes against us, we will be able to remain standing. For the attacks of the enemy against our faith in the end, for all the attacks of the enemy against our faith, in the end our faith will remain. Hallelujah. Matthew 24, verses 3 through 13. And as he, Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? End of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places, meaning unusual and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you, believers, up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity or wrongdoing shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So the Lord says, all these things are going to happen. And the closer we get to His coming, the church is going to come under persecution. It's going to happen. People of faith are going to come under persecution. It's going to happen. If you think, foolish American, that you can prevent this from happening, if you think America is the one exception to the rule that everywhere else in the world they're going to see these things happen, but Jesus wasn't talking about America. He's talking about over there in the Middle East. He's talking about over there in Africa. He's talking about over there in Asia and in Europe and all that like that there. If you think that's the case, you're foolish. You're foolish. The truth is, the battle is coming to the saints. The closer we get to the end of this age, the battle will come to the saints. But we have been given armor. That armor is designed to protect us and to preserve us, to allow our faith to stand even in the face of death. Why? Because the only people who are going to be saved are those whose faith can survive to the end. Whatever we face, whatever happens, their faith will not depart from them. Their faith will not be compromised. They will not be able to let go of their confidence in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord said, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. So why does it not make sense to you then that the armor of God is defensive? Why? So that we can withstand when? In that evil day. 
for what purpose so that when it's all over what's happening we're still standing do you follow what i'm saying see it all makes sense it all comes together it's one good puzzle one big puzzle it all comes together perfectly we understand exactly what the lord was saying said i've given you this armor so that your faith can survive any attack no matter how powerful no matter how great it may be the word of god today keeps us grounded it keeps us established in sound doctrine it forever binds us to the cross of calvary and the accomplished work of the lord jesus christ the Word of God will not allow us to be drawn away after false gods and polluted doctrines. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 6, the apostle writes to his apprentice, as it were, Timothy, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils we are seeing this in america today speaking lies in hypocrisy we are seeing that in america today having their conscience seared with a hot iron we are seeing that in america today forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which god hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. What is the most important piece of armor that we can wear? The truth. Having your loins girt about with the truth. Verse 4, Timothy 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So what is Paul telling us? He's saying, the Word of God will keep you grounded. The Word of God will keep you in right teaching. The Word of God will keep you in right thinking. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 we read, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Folks, armor is to be worn to prevent harm or injury to the individual who wears it as they strive to defend themselves against attack. The sword is given to God's people so that we might ward off enemy advances. If our sword is able to prevent our being injured or killed, it has done its job. It may also be used, listen, for any number of peacetime uses which have nothing in the world to do with war or struggle the sword uh, in ancient times could be used to manufacture shelter cut wood for fire create clothing from animal skins dress meats for food clear brush or brambles so that we might move freely and without obstruction do you see the sword of the Spirit, which is part of our armor, has many, many peacetime uses that are constructive, that help us to survive. The Word of God. It's not there to run around 
murdering people and destroying people and carelessly wielding it and cutting people to shreds. That is not what the sword of the Spirit is given to God's people to do. No, that sword, if we're living peaceable lives as God's people have been called to live, then that sword is able to serve many functions for us that will help to preserve our lives that will help to keep us alive we can cut wood for fire we can create shelters with it we can hunt with it we can dress uh, food for it I mean there are so many uses that a sharp edge has amen oh I want to tell you today much like handguns in our modern American society far too many have access to the Word of God. Not everyone who possesses the Word knows how to properly handle it. Not everyone who owns the Bible even knows when and where it is to be brandished and for what purpose. It is only to be drawn when the enemy is present and he would try to convince us to do contrary to the will of God to make us compromise our faith or forfeit our confidence in the gospel. Then and only then is the word of God to be taken from its sheath and used to force the enemy into retreat. Let's look quickly today. Luke chapter 4, the first 13 verses, Jesus is tempted of Satan in the wilderness. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He took his sword out of the sheath, and he brandished it to put off what? The enemy. But it was the real enemy. He used the Word of God against the true enemy, against Satan himself. He didn't use it against any person. Listen, we go on. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, out comes the sword, oh hallelujah. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. And He brought him, meaning the devil brought the Lord to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. Now listen, for it is written, he, will, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. Oh, honey, if you think the devil doesn't know how to twist and pervert Scripture, <laughs> if you think these preachers out there telling you that God's people is supposed to be hateful and malicious and angry and fearful, if you think they're not on the enemy's payroll, they're not the enemy, but if you think they're not working for the enemy, if you think they're not under the influence of the enemy, you are mistaken. Because Satan knows how to twist and pervert the Word of God to try to make it serve his purposes. His purpose is to make you step out of the will of God or to do things other than God's way. This is what he was trying to do. 
with the man Jesus Christ. He was trying to convince him in his humanity, trying to convince him to do things a different way than the way God would do it. And he perverted and twisted the scriptures in order to make it sound like what he was saying was right. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What did he do? He whipped out his sword. Hallelujah. And he used the word of God in order to push the enemy away. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Notice, the Lord didn't destroy the devil. He didn't kill the devil. But he caused the enemy to depart from him. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm here to tell you, the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit are given to us to protect us when the enemy comes at us. We can either be the peace-seeking people of God that we've been called to be, using the sword of the Spirit only in self-defense against only our spiritual enemy, or we can be men of war and conflict in this life who will have no part in the resurrection of the saints. But we cannot be both. I told you before, Hebrews 12, 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In our primary text today, again, Paul said, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The symbolism in having your feet shod. Whenever biblical symbolism speaks of how we dress our feet or, or the nature of our feet, that refers to where we're willing to go and what we're willing to do. Okay, And therefore, for him to use the language, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, he's saying you should be fully prepared at all times to pursue peace. That's exactly what Paul is saying. We're supposed to be people of peace, not people of war. In 1 Timothy 2, 1-4, my final passage today, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. We've been called to be peaceable people. We've not been called to be argumentative. We've not been called to be confrontational. We've not been called to be uh, malicious or mean-spirited. What we see in the Christian church in America today is a foul stench in the nostrils of God. Mm -hmm. Satan has twisted and perverted scripture and used mouthpieces in pulpits who are willing to preach his message rather than God's. The purpose being to convince God's people to do things in a manner that is not consistent with God's will for our lives. We understand therefore that the Word of God or the sword of the Spirit today is only to be used as a defense. 
and even then only against our one common enemy, Satan. It is not to be carelessly wielded or used against the unbeliever, nor is it to be used against one another. How many Christians, you know, they, there's an old saying that says, Christians are the only army that destroy and kill their own wounded. Christians, the only people in the world I know who run around killing each other, destroying each other. I know more Christians who think that they are justified in condemning and criticizing other Christians to the point of convincing that person to just leave church and quit even trying to live for God, quit even trying to serve the Lord. Folks, what's wrong with this picture? That's not, that's not how we're supposed to do things. You're mishandling the Word of God. You're mishandling the sword of the Spirit. It is not to be used on people, whether they be outside the church or inside the church. Right. What's wrong with us? The Word of God is there to protect us, to keep us, to establish us. We are called to live peaceably with all men. The world is full of negativity and conflict, and we are not called to embrace those things. We are a unique people, called to live peaceably. Let us then understand the right and proper way to handle our sword. Amen. Amen. I hope you've gotten something from this message today.